A uh, few years ago, I found myself in this bus full of people. The bus was full, people are overflowing into the aisle, and uh, the music was bumping so loud and in language I don't even understand. And the bus was moving so fast, possibly at the top speed, and from time to time, there would be this herds of cows just walking around, so chill, nonchalant, no problem, and just cross through it. And at the same level of speed and the same level of calmness, the driver would just swerve around. It just curve around. And every time, I thought to myself, this is it. This is how my life ends. But, but the guy was a pro, and I'm glad to tell you that I'm still standing here in one piece. Um, and, and I tell you that was one of the best journey I've ever taken in my life. <coughs> By the way, uh, I'm Haris Azwan, currently serving as a medical doctor, as mentioned. And that was me, a few years ago, traveling across the northern region of Sri Lanka, um, a region affected by 30 years civil war that ended 10 years ago. And I was traveling around uh, with one goal and one mission in mind, single-mindedly thinking, I would like to introduce 3D printing prosthetics uh, in the local re uh, rehabilitation and prosthetics care. Uh, yeah, that's me. Um, I'll tell you, uh, Sri Lanka is a beautiful country. Uh, I initially went out there uh, on this uh, micro humanitarian mission, as mentioned, uh, and I was in, uh, placed in this little farming village, uh, little farming village uh, called Omente. Uh, it's a resettlement area for internally displaced people from the war. And uh, during this time that I met this gentleman, was at first seemingly normal, uh, but soon I realized that beneath his long right hand shirt sleeve was a dead, idle, non-functioning three to four kilograms of way of supposedly electronic prosthetics, and except it's not functioning, and he's been carrying around uh, that thing for the past two years, and I was perplexed. Why would he do that? Why would he be carrying around a non-functioning three to four kilograms of burden on his shoulder every single day for two years? Uh, soon I learned this prosthesis or artificial hand was given to him by an NGO uh, that came served the region 20 years back. And the NGO came and served the region during the war. And when the war ended, this NGO and many other has left the country, uh, leaving this man with a broken arm and nowhere to go. I was like, okay, all right, all right. So I learned something. And a uh, few years prior, I was a medical student in Jordan where I would see uh, similar cases, uh, imputated uh, patients uh, fleeing from the war in Syria into Jordan. And during this time that I learned a thing or two about this new way of production of prosthesis, uh, somewhat still experimentative, uh, which is 3D printing. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, I will, I'm sure many of you are familiar, but for those who are not familiar, 3D printing is a form of manufacturing technique or technology uh, that would work like uh, icing uh, cake piping bag, you know, which means you do things layer by layer, which means you produce, uh, you could produce any form of shapes. And it has been around since 1980s, but recently, uh, with thanks to Moore's law, it's getting a lot smaller, allowing it to be, immobili to be mobilized, allowing you to produce uh, any form of shapes anywhere, theoretically. And uh, this would reduce the cost of production due to the need, because due to the need for big manufacturing setup as well as long logistic chains become obsolete. So it so turned out that this would provide good benefits for prosthesis production. With the materials used, it can become so much lighter, which is important for, for this first man. Instead of carrying around three to four kilograms, he would be carrying something a lot lighter. Uh, it can be so much cheaper. A company in UK, uh, we so happened uh, to be experimenting with 3D printing in uh, robotic prosthesis production. Uh, has managed to reduce the price of the robotic processes from 95,000 pounds sterling 
five down to three thousand pounds sterling. I don't know much about the number, but I think that's that's a bit saving. And in such case of uh, war amputation, you would see uh, the injury can be a lot more complicated and a lot more complex uh, due to the bomb blast. And uh, so there I was in this small village, living my simple kampung life, you know, and going going around in peanut farms and all. And I was standing uh, standing there with water bucket in my left hand and then torchlight on my right hand. Every time I need to go to this toilet behind my house. So I was so convinced, like, this is it. This is possibly what I need to do. This is the right thing and this is the most moral thing. And uh, so I like, you know what? Let's do this. Let's bring the 3D printing technology here. And I thought to myself, not only I would do like the people good, but I would also do the innovation good, you know, by having technology being tested on the ground. So like, you know what? Let's go. So I started jumping on this tuk-tuk, took, uh, took uh, three kilometers dirt right, and dirt road right, yeah. And, uh, and started jumping on the bus, and then went on the, uh, the traveling across the region, and met a bunch of people from regional health director to college professor, and then start seeing uh, amputees. I was, and I was going, going to go around, and I would start telling people, excuse me, sir. Do you have a minute to talk about a server 3D printer? I was like, okay. Um, and I would have multiple reactions. Some would say straight up no, and then some would, like, some would say, some would be uh, more excited. And I remember this uh, one orthopedic surgeon, really big and tall orthopedic surgeon. He would say, oh, interesting idea, son. But this won't work here. I was like, okay, okay. Um, but I think he was right. He was right, it's not going to work here, not because of the technology won't work here, but because, the, because of the approach I, I took. There's no way I can go around and start telling people, every single person, when I have five more weeks in the land. Uh, there's no way I could do any form of change. So, um, I decided to, to re-device my approach uh, and start to to go to certain principles that I would, I would write down and, and uh, to, to start this change. <laughs> so maybe I would like to share, uh, so maybe certain uh, principles would possibly be beneficial for any of you, but if, if it won't be, but that's why I, I hope you get something. So, so how did I uh, uh, finally ended up with a Center for Processes? Um, innovation or research capacity in, uh, on the better crown, last better crown of the world in five weeks. So the first thing I realized that have situational awareness, know where you are, know exactly where you are. So I realized that this technology, uh, there's certain learning curves to it. There's clinical learning curves to it and there's in technical learning curves to it. So I, I realized that uh, from early on. So I would need uh, some insights from clinicians as well as the engineers. So by going around, just telling clinicians who won't do. Second, I realized that I only have five weeks uh, left on the land. So by going around, it's possibly the stupidest, uh, I'm sorry, I say that, probably the least smartest way uh, I, would, I would approach. So instead, I need to, to convince as many pe people as possible uh, at the shortest time possible. So you know, that basically you, the best way is to gather everyone at the same time. So bring people together. Um, trying to change things at scales, most of the time would involve changing in consensus. You would see throughout the history, things happen when people start coming together. Uh, and only with the change in consensus, you would see the change in collective action. And when there is change in collective action, then can you see the change in external reality, which is the desired outcome. So I'm like, all right, let's bring everyone together. But it's impossible to bring everyone together, so just bring the right people together. Uh, so I decided So uh, I decided to bring uh, the, the right stakeholders together. So I brought uh, clinicians from governments and non-governments, uh, stakeholders in the local providers' capacity. Uh, I bring engineers as well as patients, because they are the people that are important for the issues. And I know it's not easy to bring everyone together at the same time, but you know, hustle, just hustle, try your best. Um, so I managed to bring uh, the stakeholders, 
uh, in the issues together and put them in one room. And I, uh, this is the patient, and and I encourage them to be as as, invent, as invested as possible, uh, which means give them some skin in the game. Instead of me showing how to do things, uh, I would allow them to take responsibility and to take charge of, of the patients, of the problem. So I would just guide them throughout the process, rather. Uh, they, the clinicians would provide their clinical insights, how to help this patient, and the engineers would provide the technical solution, of which they have uh, some learning curve. Okay, not really. Um, all right. So, so but make it easy. Uh, what do I mean by make it easy? You need to reduce people's psychological and mental barrier as slow as possible so that they would be receptive to whatever you want to do. Uh, I make it easy for the clinicians to take up this thing uh, by, allow, by give, providing them engineers and I make it easy for the engineers to take up my, my idea by providing them clinicians. And uh, lo and behold, uh, after one, one week, there's two teams. Uh, the first team that was working with this deminer uh, who lost both of his limb during demining activity, uh, they didn't manage to produce any so form of solution for the patient. I think, you know what, that's fair. It's just one week. Uh, but the other team that was working with the lady uh, who lost uh, her hand uh, during a bomb blast uh, 18 years ago and has been dependent on the family even for simple activity as to eat, in the end of one week, they managed to fit the first ever produced prosthetic finger in the region. And when the local providers uh, managed to produce uh, this thing that has never been produced before, has, was not possible previously, makes it easy for the clinical, for decision makers, sorry, uh, decision makers uh, to see that when I, what I was talking about was not a, such an abstract concept, rather a doable, tangible, and workable solution. And with this one little plastic finger, uh, uh, has allowed us to progress to the next step, which was the establishment for center prosthetics right on top of the last battleground of the wall. So now the, the center is running uh, and functioning and improving uh, the, the state of local healthcare uh, prosthetics uh, care delivery. And, uh, and, and ha that has uh, granted us funding from Ministry of Rehabilitation uh, of Sri Lanka. And I think in the end, it's all about turning big small. I would have like this idea of trying to improve many, many lives, but that was impossible for you to do in five weeks, provided that not only, not only because it's only impossible it's in five weeks, but it is also impossible because I didn't know anyone in the region. I didn't know anyone in the system previously. But what was possible? was that try to encourage people to be together with you, try to encourage people to take, uh, to be motivated as much as you, uh, and to, to do the change together. And I think within five weeks, that was possible. So I think uh, what I like to say is that big gets you the attention, but small gets you the action and motion. With that, I'm Harris Aswan, and thank you.